hundred years, they ruled the largest continuous land empire in history. Twice the size of Caesar's Roman Empire. Longer lasting than Napoleon's. As world shaking as Alexander the Great's. They are the Mongols. The fury that rolls like a storm out of the steppes. In the early 13th century, the Mongols pioneer a style of warfare unparalleled in cunning and cruelty. And so revolutionary, it still inspires military strategists today. Sweeping east and west, destroying everything in their path, they shatter the old world order and carve a new course of history. It is the end of the 12th century. As Europe lies mired in the Dark Ages, two cultures set the standard for human civilization. The Islamic states in Persia and Central Asia. And far away to the east, a trio of fabulous kingdoms in China. Between these stretch vast, inhospitable grasslands, the Eurasian steppes. Although the steppes are formidable, they are not empty. Nomadic tribes, the Tatars, Mongols, and others, eke out a grim life. These are some of the coldest places on Earth in Mongolia. Temperatures 90 degrees below zero. So for much of the year, they're fighting nature. It's a life with no, no margin of safety in it. It is in this time of upheaval that great Mongol conqueror Genghis Khan arises in the 12th century. He does so not from a family of kings or princes, but as a fatherless boy facing death with his family on the barren steppes. Genghis Khan's given name is Timujin, Mongolian for iron worker. It's fitting. His life will demand an iron will. Genghis Khan's father had been an up-and-coming tribal chieftain. Uh, perhaps if he'd lived, he might have become the next uh, uh, Khan of the Mongols. But as soon as he was poisoned, the widows of the previous Khan led the Mongols to desert the widows of Gisage, Genghis's father. And the result was that Genghis Khan was left on the steppe alone with his mother, Abandoned with her children, Timogen's mother gives him a simple charge. Seek revenge. For 30 grueling years, Timogen fights to unite his clan and gain the title of Khan, great leader. By the age of 40, he has grown to be a gifted chieftain. We're looking at a man like Alexander, like Hitler, I have to say, with immense charisma, who made people follow him by the strength of his personality. Having united his tribe in 1196, Timogen turns to the second task. Vengeance. As far as we can tell, in virtually every battle they fought, in every battle they won, the Mongols were substantially outnumbered by their enemies. The Mongols' combination of finely honed horsemanship and tactical strategy overwhelms their enemies. They are virtually wiped from the face of the earth in just two years. Only their name will live on. And they are but the first of many for Timogen is molding his army into the finest light cavalry the world has ever seen. And he does take revenge on the people who had inflicted so much hardship on, on his family, uh, his larger family, and on his immediate family, namely the Tatars, who, when he finally defeats them, he, uh, the, as the story goes, he has ev everyone uh, taller than the axle of a wagon uh, executed. So he, he decimates, he destroys this particular tribe. In 1206, a ruler's council of steppe tribes acclaims Timogen as universal leader, or Genghis Khan. 
He now stands poised to conquer the rest of the world and seal his reputation as the bloodiest of all barbarians. By the year 1206, Genghis Khan's power over the steppes is unchallenged. Now he directs his vengeance on the wealthy and arrogant Jin of China. In 1211, the Mongols move to invade China. The enormous ancient nation sees them as scruffy upstarts out to stir up a little trouble. The Chinese have no idea what they are about to face. Within hours of their initial meeting, the Mongol troops annihilate a much larger Chinese force. The nomads learn fast. They copy Chinese siege technology to breach their city walls. They become the embodiment of terror. And then they start beating their drums. And these drums are carried by four people on ropes. And the mere sound of them drove people mad with fear. They brought with them the prisoners from the previous city that they captured and pushed them into the moat so that they could go over them, over the dead bodies at the city walls. And then they would slaughter every living thing, the very cats and the dogs. In 1215, they lay waste to the capital of northern China, Chengdu present-day Beijing. Genghis Khan launches a crusade that takes him far from his business in China. The Mongols annex one kingdom after another. Before crossing into each new territory, Genghis Khan gives the local ruler the option to surrender peacefully. But if the ruler resists, Genghis Khan warns he will show no mercy. He writes one chieftain, the disaster will reach you. Two. Genghis Khan's campaign of vengeance has swelled his empire till it touches the borders of the ancient kingdom of Khwarezm in present-day Uzbekistan. Though Khwarezm is an attractive target, Genghis Khan goes no farther. He has learned something new. I think that the key moment in the career of Genghis Khan that lifted him from being a territorial chieftain in Outer Mongolia to a player on the world stage was when he began to realize that his territories were on the Silk Road and that he could change the fortunes of his people by trade. And so he sent a series of embassies to his nearest neighbor, the Sultan Muhammad, who was the ruler of the Eastern Islamic world. And those embassies were finally followed by a caravan of 1,500 camels. Camel caravan was so rich that it tickled the, the greed of the Muslim governor of the front, and he simply seized it. Genghis Khan's final dispatch to Sultan Muhammad is simple and grim. You have chosen war, he writes. After a five-month siege, the Mongols burst through the defenses and lay waste to everyone and everything in their path. There is no limit to their cruelty. Why were the Mongols so cruel? It's, it's a difficult question and no one really knows the explanation but the fact of it I think can't be doubted so they sowed salt in the fields they destroyed the wells they flooded the cities they cut the canals they chopped down the orchards as if there were no tomorrow the Mongols monstrous rampage devastates magnificent Persian cities like Balkh and Herat so the destruction that they visited on the Eastern Islamic world has lasted to this day. The ruins of once great cities still lay scattered across Persia like ghost towns. With the annexation of Khwarezm, Genghis Khan's empire reaches from the Yellow River all the way to the Caspian Sea. 
the largest continuous land empire in the history of the world. The most remarkable result of this Mongol conquest is that East is open to West for the first time in a thousand years. A Pax Mongolica, a Mongol peace, allowed people for the first time to travel in absolute safety from Rome to Beijing. It was never possible before, and it wasn't possible until the 20th century afterwards. It's not a small thing. And that created a kind of knowledge of uh, the knowledge, each civilization in Eurasia acquiring more knowledge about each other. Ironically, creating such an empire is not Genghis Khan's goal. The flame of vengeance still burns in his belly, and he still has a score to settle with the Chinese. To that end, he now turns, but it is the one thing beyond his reach. In 1227, in his mid-60s, Genghis Khan dies on the march to China. According to legend, the victim of a freak riding accident. Armed troops and slave girls escort his body back to the steps, where he is laid to rest in secrecy. In an eruption of violent conquest, the Mongolian Empire continues to expand after Genghis Khan's death in 1227. In the west, the Golden Horde, descendants of Genghis Khan, rules southern Russia and Khwarazam. In the far east, the Khan's grandson defeats and unites the three kingdoms of China. Kublai Khan was the grandson of the legendary Mongol warlord, Genghis Khan. Like his grandfather, Kublai crushed his enemies with brute force. Yet he ruled his own lands peacefully, setting up governments, creating systems of taxation, and promoting culture and commerce. He made Beijing the capital of the biggest empire the world had ever seen, stretching from the shores of the China Sea to the River Danube in Europe, and from Siberia to the Indian Ocean. But his greatest achievement was the unification of China, a unification that survives to this day. And although he reigned over 700 years ago, his story is one that still has great significance. The Venetian traveler Marco Polo, who lived in Kublai's court for more than 20 years, described him as a man of middle height with a figure of just proportion and a face that was somewhat red, which may have resulted from his love of food and alcohol. But he was also capable of extreme violence, barbarity and cruelty. He carved out his great empire with one battle after another, and even though his military career started quite late in his life, his skill in combat was second to none. But there was another very different side to his character. Throughout his reign, the wise Khan, as he was known, courted the most sophisticated, intellectual, scientific and artistic minds of the day. And he was very practical recognizing the benefits that freedom of trade and effective taxation would bring. But as the Mongol Empire spread across Asia, there was one major obstacle they couldn't overcome. The Sung Empire of southern China had over 50 million people and vast resources. For years, the Mongols tried to conquer this giant of the south, but were unsuccessful. It was going to take a warrior of very special abilities to overcome the resistance of the Sung dynasty that ruled southern China. This man was Kublai Khan. In Persia, the Mongols convert to Islam, building fabulous mosques to glorify their new god. Still, as successful as the Mongolian Empire may be, its huge size makes it difficult to maintain. There weren't enough Mongols. This was not a gigantic nation. It wasn't like China, for example. The vaulted skyline of modern-day Istanbul 
bears testament to the one dynasty that stood in the way of Timur's dream of a Genghis-sized empire, the Ottoman Turks. With the defeat of the Ottomans in 1402, Timur's empire nearly matches Genghis Khan's in size and scope. Predictably, it is not enough for the voracious conqueror. To secure his place in history, he must do his hero one better. And the only way to accomplish this is to take what Genghis could not, China. But like Genghis Khan, Timur mysteriously falls ill and dies on the march to China. Without the force of Timur's personality and leadership, his heirs are unable to hold the empire together. The Mongols begin to fade into history. Too small in number to rule their vast empire, they become assimilated into the cultures they conquer, adopting their religions and customs as their own. And yet, their impact remains immeasurable even today. By opening China to the West, the Mongols created an insatiable thirst for Asian goods. The drive to quench it spurred the age of discovery and the voyages that would lead Europe to America. Truly, by shattering the old empires of China and Persia, the Mongols gave birth to the modern world. Will the world ever see another empire like it? In Mongolia, some fervently hope so. Even today, Genghis Khan is worshipped there as a god. His name is a source of national pride, his tent a hallowed shrine. Small wonder, then, that the Mongols wait eagerly for the spirit to rise anew and for the barbarian to return.